we commence this Bible study this evening with prayer. Let us seek the Lord. Holy, heavenly Father, reigning in glory and in majesty and in power, we humble ourselves before you this evening, acknowledging willingly and with adoration that you and you alone are the only true and living God, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one glorious Godhead. Help us to bow before you now with humility, with reverence and confession of our sin. Lord, we are reminded in our thinking as we pray of thy servant Isaiah, who had a vision of Christ upon the throne, and he cried, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King. Help us to understand more and more the privilege of worship, the privilege of prayer, the privilege of praise, the privilege of coming to your holy word and learning from it, to understand in a deeper way our own dependence upon you, our own unworthiness, And may this experience, under the Spirit's power, lead us to a greater dependence and wonder and faith in your provision for us, in the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. How we thank you that he is the all-sufficient one, the all-sufficient Saviour, the glorious High Priest, our Lord, and that one day he is coming again in glory and majesty, And the end of time will come, and all those who are truly saved will be gathered together as one family in the new heavens and in the new earth with glorified bodies and eternally satisfied, eternally happy, eternally blessed in the very presence of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Oh, the wonders of redemption, not only that we are forgiven, not only that we are rescued from hell, not only that we are redeemed from the power of the enemy, but we are redeemed unto glory. Help us to respect and wonder at these blessed truths of salvation. And this evening as we come to consider the doctrine of repentance and the doctrine of faith, uh, may we realise that these are all ordained of God and they are essential parts of coming to God and believing in God. And they themselves, those two aspects of salvation, repentance and faith, are themselves gifts of God. So we're utterly dependent upon you, our gracious God, and we come in that way now, fallen at your feet, pleading with you to remember us in your mercy and in your grace, and cleanse us afresh, we pray, and give us hearts now and minds to receive your word, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. We sing together hymn number 726. 726. Love divine, or love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. 726.
Please turn with me to the Word of God for our instruction in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 15 and we read from verse 11. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 15 and we read from verse 11. Then Jesus said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. And will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Well, we come again this evening in our Bible study to consider another aspect of the doctrine of salvation. And in this study we're going to consider first the doctrine of repentance, and then there will be another aspect, the doctrine of faith. First of all, The doctrine of repentance. Now repentance is a turning from sin and sinful ways unto God. It means a person has been convicted of their sin and their guilt before God and is responding to this conviction. True repentance always involves a change of mind and heart. It leads to a change of conduct 
And this truth is powerfully taught in a parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15, which we read together. A son rebels against his father, he demands his inheritance, and on receiving it, he leaves home, full of expectation and pride and rebellion. And we read that he wasted his inheritance. He lived a a life of sin and depravity, far away from his father, but still under the all-seeing eye of God. But then poverty came into his life. And we read he came to himself. And that is what repentance is. It means you're coming to yourself. You understand the true state of your condition. He realised the error of his ways. He was shown under conviction. And when he sincerely and humbly reflected upon his life and situation, he did five things. He acknowledged his own responsibility for his sin and his situation. He confessed his sin, realising he had rebelled first against God and then against his father. And this is a solemn realisation about repentance that we come to see that our sin is first and foremost against God. He returned to his father and uh, he came totally dependent upon his mercy. He sought forgiveness. He sincerely turned from his evil ways. He submitted to the lordship of God over his life and the authority of his father. And this parable teaches that true repentance shows itself in sorrow for sin that leads to a changed life. But interestingly, if we study this uh, parable in some detail, uh, we can see that Uh, the son actually had made up uh, uh, his speech to to say before his father. He recognised his unworthiness. He recognised that he was dependent upon uh, the mercy of his father. Uh, But uh, uh, he wanted to somehow um, uh, contribute to his reconciliation. So he said, make me as one of your hired servants. That was the uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the the speech he was going to make he, he said um, uh, very clearly in this parable what he was going to say I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him father I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son so there we have uh, the true elements of confession uh, and the repentance in turning and there, but then he says, make me like one of your hired servants. So in some way I've got to uh, now um, uh, earn uh, this reconciliation. But what is very interesting is that when he comes to the father, he, he's only allowed to say the first part. The son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he's just about to say, so make me one of your higher servants. But the father interjects there. At that point, he said, the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hands and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it and eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to be merry. This is mercy. This is grace. This is the gospel. We cannot earn our salvation. Make me as one of your hired servants. Well, uh, 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 the father intervenes. And he said, this is all of grace, this forgiveness. It's all of mercy. It's all of love. It's free forgiveness. And you won't be as a hired servant. You'll be my son again. You'll be as my son. And you'll walk about the house as my son. 
I'm going to show this. I'm going to give you the best robe. And so it is with the Lord. We come to him in repentance. We come to him by faith. And God gives us a robe of righteousness. He adopts us into his family. All of grace and all of mercy. He gives us a robe of righteousness. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. He adopts us into his family. We are sons and daughters. This is the outcome of repentance. But let's move a bit uh, further into this doctrine of repentance. The parable teaches us that true repentance shows itself in sorrow for sin. A turning towards God that leads to a changed life. Repentance affects the three elements of a person's soul. Namely, the mind, the heart, and the will. The mind intellectually accepts the reality of personal guilt and defilement and sin and helplessness. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. It's not about being a hired servant. For by the law, and that's his purpose, is the knowledge of sin. It is God's holy law. And as we consider God's holy law in comparison with our, our unholy life, we come to a knowledge of sin. The mind, the heart, emotionally grieves and is sorrowful for sin committed against the holy And a just God. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of. The sorrow of the world works death. Godly sorrow. Works repentance. A true repentance. The heart. And thirdly the will. The will. Under the regenerating work of the spirit within has a change of purpose and direction, turning from sin and having a disposition to seek pardon and cleansing and submit to God as both Saviour and Lord. And so we are reminded of this in this wonderful promise in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. For he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Abundant mercy, abundant grace, abundant pardon. Now the Lord Jesus warns us that repentance is absolutely essential for salvation. And that the preaching of the gospel must teach repentance as a precondition of forgiveness. Jesus says, I tell you, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Except you repent. And uh, we read in Luke 24, verse 47, again the words of the Lord Jesus, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We read of that in in, in, in Luke 24 and verse uh, 47. These are the words of the Lord Jesus uh, just before his ascension. Let's read them again. And thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance and remission of sins through repentance and faith. Repentance is a condition towards eternal life. It is a result of the work of God's Holy Spirit in a person's life. And in Acts chapter 11 verse 18 When they heard these things, they held their peace and they glorified God, saying, 
that God has also given to the Gentiles repentance unto life. God's given it. Repentance unto life. There's a purpose to repentance. That's why repentance is so important as an aspect of the gospel. It leads to something beautiful, worthy, precious. Forgiveness and life. Repentance in the working of God comes as a result of a changed view of God. You remember how Job struggled so much with what was happening in his life? And we read of this struggle and the uh, unwise advice and counsel of his friends at the time. And when we come to the end of the book of Job, we have this transforming attitude of Job, or this developing attitude of Job toward God. And God had used this terrible trial to deepen the work of grace in the life of Job to a deeper understanding of God. And he said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear and now my eye sees you. And what is the reaction? Wherefore I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Repentance comes as a result of a changed view of ourselves. An example of this is clearly seen in the testimony of David when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and authorised the murder of her husband. At first David's heart remained hard and full of self-justification. He considered himself above the law. But then God sent his servant Nathan to visit David And he told him a parable about a rich man who had taken a poor man's lamb. And David was very angry. And Nathan used the last part of his message. And it came with such power. You are the man. And it cut through his hypocrisy and self-righteousness and the hardness of his heart. And it brought conviction of sin. He came to himself and the result was that David realised his sin personally. He realised that it was not only terrible but ultimately against God. And so we have Psalm 51. Against you and you only have I sinned. Repentance. But now we move on to faith. Faith. Now there are different kinds of of faith. The Bible does not always speak of faith in the same sense. It refers to a faith consisting of an intellectual acceptance of the truth of Scripture, but without any real moral or spiritual response. So many people will say they believe in God, and they may have a knowledge of the truth of Scripture, but such a belief is merely in the mind. It has not affected the heart and does not lead them ultimately to personally trust in Jesus Christ as their Saviour and Lord. And so uh, uh, Paul is saying to King Agrippa, King Agrippa, believe you the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said unto Paul, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Almost. We read in James, you believe there is one God. Well, you do well because the the devils also believe and tremble. So this intellectual belief is not enough. The Bible also speaks of a temporary faith, which embraces the truths of religion with some promptings of conscience and a stirring of the affections even, but it is not rooted in a regenerated heart. It is called a temporary faith because it has no abiding character and fails to maintain itself in days of trial and persecution. 
And Jesus speaks of this in the parable of the sower and the seed. He speaks of a person that hears the word and with joy he receives it. But because he has not the root in himself, he just endures for a while. But when trouble comes and tribulation and persecution, he is offended and walks no more with the Lord Jesus. The Bible also makes mention of a faith which believes that a miracle can be performed by God or through his power, but not necessarily accompanied with a saving faith. Not all those that were healed by the Lord Jesus even had saving faith. They were healed of their um, illnesses and their disabilities. Some of those we uh, have uh, 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 evidence that they came to follow God and believe in God. But what about the, 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 the ten lepers? They were all healed. But only one had the saving faith to come back and thank the Lord Jesus. Most significantly, the Bible stresses the necessity of saving faith. The faith. It's not like any other faith. Its seed is implanted in regeneration, as we have discussed previously in the work of the Holy Spirit, and it gradually blossoms into an active faith. It may be defined as a positive conviction wrought in the heart by the Holy Spirit as to the truth of the gospel and a hearty reliance on the promises of God in Christ. So he says, Louis Berkhoff in his summary of Christian doctrine. Saving faith such as this is a gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Saving faith then. Let's just consider this. Saving faith. Faith like repentance. Saving faith affects the three elements of a person's soul, namely the mind, the heart and the will. The mind, there is a positive recognition of the truth in the mind as revealed through the truth of God's word and the preaching of it. It involves a spiritual insight which accepts the perfect truth of God's way of salvation in Jesus Christ. It embraces the promises of God which confirm that way. So Paul says in Romans 10.17 So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The mind. Secondly, the heart. We have this same pattern as we've looked at in repentance. The heart. There is an emotional response to the truth, demonstrating itself in a heartfelt belief and conviction of its significance and importance. We read, it, for example, when the Lord Jesus was preaching to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they said, did not our heart burn within us as he talked with us by the way? as he opened up to us the scriptures? So they received it through the mind and as they received it as the truth of God, it affected their heart. And there was his heart burning. Thirdly, the will. This is what could be described as the crown and element of saving faith. That which affects the will. This means a personal trust in Christ as Saviour and Lord. This includes a surrender of the soul as guilty and defiled to Christ. It is an utter dependence upon him as the source of pardon and spiritual life. The object of saving faith is Jesus Christ and the promise of salvation in him and the will is affected under the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. It coordinates with the heart and with the mind and the whole being of a person 
depends upon Christ alone. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is not condemned. We are not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even as we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. This saving faith is not of human origin. It is a gift of God. However, its exercise is a human activity under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit working on the mind, the heart and the will. We are given this new nature and it brings forth a fruit in our life. Love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith. For God-given saving faith understands the gospel message of salvation, believes in that message And trusts in the person of that message. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth says. As he comes to the end of his letter in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1. He said moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. That which also you have received and wherein you stand. But which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you. Unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you. First of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. God-given faith trusts and understands the gospel message of salvation. And it understands that faith is absolutely essential to salvation and to the ongoing Christian walk with all its challenges. So, we'll now move on to faith as it works in a Christian believer. We've spoken about saving faith, coming to God through Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, working upon the mind, the heart and the will. A Christian believer pleases God by faith. We are told something very solemn in Hebrews 11 verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And a Christian not only pleases God by faith, a Christian walks by faith. We walk by faith. And not by sight. We stand by faith. By faith you stand. We live by faith. The just shall live by faith. We have access to God by faith. In Romans 5.2 By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. Oh, we resist the devil by faith. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 5, 9 says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith. And we pray by faith. James reminds us in James 1.6 But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Nothing wavering by faith. And then uh, we overcome by faith. In Hebrews 11 verse 35, 33 to 34 speaking of these great worthies of the faith in the Old Testament they had that same saving faith who through faith 
subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion, lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned flight to flight the armies of the aliens, who, through faith, so faith is not only essential to salvation, faith is essential to our walk as a Christian. But now we move on to the growth of saving faith. Faith is something which should grow. And the Bible recommends to us ways in which faith can develop in a person. It develops by believing and trusting in God's word. We read of the example of Abraham, the man of God. He was not weak in faith, that even though he considered his body as being dead, about a hundred years old, he didn't, and, and, and neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, the impossibility of having a son, humanly speaking, we read he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Romans 4, 19. Isn't that amazing? That faith of Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God. He hung on to it. It was his strength. It was his stability. It was his security. It was his hope. He was strong in faith because of the promise of God. That was his strength. It was not strength in faith itself, but the strength of the faith was in its object, the promise of God. And we can pray for a stronger faith. The apostle said unto the Lord, Lord, increase our faith. Our faith can be increased by fellowship with like-minded believers. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And we realise that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. By hearing and reading God's word. Not only by believing and trusting in it, but by hearing and reading it and studying it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the faith grows by obedience. Faith and obedience are the best of friends. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only. But then, in God's spiritual gymnasium, he calls us to exercise his faith at all times. We read, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. It is at all times. But also, faith increases in service. As we serve the Lord in a committed manner, not out of duty, but inspired by a willing love, Oh, we find a faith which worketh by love. Love in obedience. Love in service. Love in one another. It, it works by love. Uh, and uh, our faith is increased. We, we have answers to prayer. We have encouragements in the way. Yes, there's much to cast us down. There's much to, uh, to, to, to trouble us and to oppose us and to hinder us. But you will find, as you serve the Lord by faith, that the Lord will give you tokens of encouragement. He will do so. And value them. By faith. And then, finally, faith increases as we regularly attend the worship services, the prayer meetings, the Bible study, and the Lord's Supper. 
We do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but we exhort one another so much the more as the day approaches. As the Lord helps us, as we are enabled, there are, uh, we have, of course, uh, restrictions at this time. Uh, and uh, there are other uh, duties uh, in the home and at work which prevent us sometimes uh, from uh, being able to come out. And sometimes we're not uh, strong enough uh, in our health and mind. But our desire should be, as the Lord helps us, to attend as much as we can the worship services, the meetings together of the gathered church, Bible studies and the Lord's Supper. And this will help, it should help and increase our faith. And if it doesn't, there's either something wrong with the ministry or with the fellowship or with ourselves. The problem is never with God. The problem is never with his word. The problem is never with the principle of worship and the prayer meetings and the Bible studies uh, and the Lord's Supper and the preaching in terms of the means of grace. They are set by God and they are his wisdom for us. The issue is, do they have the unction and the blessing of the Holy Spirit upon them and within us? That is what we're looking for. And that is what we seek. So may the Lord grant to us a greater and deeper appreciation of the wonder of repentance and the wonder of faith. And may it lead to a deeper praise of our almighty God. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening is number 642. 642. I am trust in Thee, Lord Jesus, trust in only Thee, trust in Thee for full salvation, great and free.
pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we have considered those two essential doctrines of repentance and faith, we pray that we will realize this evening uh, the absolute importance of them. And we do pray that if there be any listening this evening who as yet have not truly repented and put their trust in the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, that you would work in their lives in the power of your Holy Spirit and work in their wills and their whole being that they might come just as they are, acknowledging their sin, turn towards God, coming by faith in the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and Him alone, having their complete and utter dependence upon Him. How we thank you that you are a God of mercy and a God of grace and how that was depicted for us in the way that the Father welcomed back His wayward Son. O gracious God, fill us with Praise and adoration at the wonders of your abundant mercy. And now may the grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and continue with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>